Travel Television visited the mall to see Peace Corps exhibits at the Folk Life Festival. The Peace Corps experience is transformational, according to the first ever survey of alumni. See the results in this episode. All this and more, so on to our first stop. The Peace Corps commemorated 50 years of service at the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. Peace Corps, the ones who came to Belize, with the help of Tim O'Malley and the other guys came, did their work, and now we're here doing our thing. The Peace Corps, 200,000 plus volunteers serving in 139 countries, something all Americans can celebrate. <laughs> I served in Peru from 1965 to 1967, teaching English at the University, National University of Trujillo, Peru. We served in Poland from 93 to 95 and... 93 to 96. And 92 to 95. I served in Brazil, 69 through 71. And I proudly served in the Dominican Republic, 1987 to 1989. Okay, I served in Ukraine, particularly Lviv and Mykolaiv, Ukraine. I served in Albania from 2005 to 2007. I served in the Republic of Macedonia. I served in Zambia from 2007 to 2009. I served in Thailand in Naratiwat, southern Thailand, 1967 to 69. A great experience. Recommend it to everyone, maybe even you. <laughs> That's why they're all here. The Peace Corps goals are simple provide technical assistance to desiring countries and promote mutual friendship between the United States and the world. No doubt the Peace Corps changed the world, but what about the volunteers? How has the Peace Corps changed your life? Hi, uh, it helps you to be patient. It also teaches you uh, what a big world we have and how many the differences there are in the world. Um, the Peace Corps changed my life by opening my eyes and opening my mind. I have a much more um, a much stronger affinity to other cultures and other people after having served um, in Macedonia. And uh, I, I was in the Master's International Program and so I got my Master's degree and had the experience of Peace Corps together, so that was fantastic. Peace Corps Chile totally changed my life. I got very involved in Latin American affairs, I went into academics, became an economist because I was inspired by the work that the economists were doing in Chile. Then I joined the State Department, eventually the National Security Council at the White House. The Peace Corps changed my life and it gave me an appreciation that people are people wherever you go. They have the same desires, the same needs, and it doesn't matter how much money they have. It was really interesting to see how little they got by with and how little I can get by with. It opened me up to the world. I hadn't done much traveling before that, so it was a chance to see some of the world that I would probably never would have seen before and learn that people from all over the world are basically the same. Good people trying to make the best of life. Um, Zambians are very loving, good people and, and I gained a family on the other side of the world. Meeting a guy, getting married, come, then coming back. This, this was actually my re-entry back into the United States, this festival. So. I uh, probably won't know the extent to which it's changed my life for, you know, maybe another few months, but already it has been the most amazing three years of my life. Set the tone of the rest of my life and what I've wanted to do in life. The Peace Corps has made me a citizen of the world, not just a citizen of the United States. Living abroad for two years, learning the language and the culture of Peru made me sensitive to a different way of life and able to appreciate life in ways that we need to learn in this country as well. Our country today needs the Peace Corps more than ever. Good thing the federal agency is 50 years young and going strong. So the party goes on. <laughs> Hi, Charlie Abel here with Travel Television. We have a very distinguished guest with us today in our studios, Mike Walter, formerly of Channel 9 WUSA here in Washington. You've been doing a few different things over the last year, yeah? And one of them took place in New Orleans, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, I have as much passion, I think, for volunteerism as you do. I, I had the opportunity as a journalist to go down 
and cover uh, Hurricane Katrina, but also to go down and actually work in the volunteering aspect and trying to help uh, with the rebuilding aspect. As you know, there's a lot of that that still needs to be done. But it really taught me a lot. You know, you, a lot of times journalists parachute into a community, we tell a couple of stories, we think we know the community, we really don't. But to actually get immersed in there and, and see how people are impacted. Um, one of the days we were down there volunteering and, and uh, we were gutting this home and it was the dead of summer and the humidity and oh man, we were it's Pretty dying. hot down there, oh, pretty oh, hot oh. down there in August, right? Oh, brutal. And this woman uh, came up to us, we were working on her father's house and she said, y you look like you're dying, can I go get you something to drink? You know, you want a soda or some water and I'll run up to the store and get you something. And uh, I said, well, you know, I could use some water and a couple of the other volunteers said the same thing. And we kept working and it seemed like we were working there for another hour and I'm like, when is this lady coming back with the water? And, and we pretty much finished what we were doing and, um, and I wanted to leave. And one of the other journalists who had volunteered said, no, no, that woman went to get us water. You know, we should wait until she drives back and brings the water and then have a water and talk to her and then we can leave. So we waited and then all of a sudden we heard the clank, clank, clank of the shopping cart, you know, and you don't realize, you know, that the people that you're helping. She didn't drive. They don't have anything. You she know. literally ran. She literally ran water. and came back with the shopping cart with water for us. And it really kind of hits home, you know, what the gifts that we have and how some people really do need a helping hand. And boy, I'll tell you, it was, it was a great feeling to be able to help down there. Right. So uh, what I learned about uh, that your production company produced was the documentary film Breaking News, Breaking Down, which deals with post-traumatic stress. Um, and I want you to tell us more about it. What we focus on in this film are the journalists who work in their communities who are impacted by the stories that they tell. Um, and I talk about my own experience covering 9-11. Um, I, I witnessed the jet going into the Pentagon and I talk about how that impacted me uh, emotionally. And then I also talk about David Hanch, who's a photojournalist in New York who was uh, outside the uh, World Trade Center and, and it actually came down right on top of him. Physically he was uh, he was impacted as well as emotionally. And then John McCusker who was down in New Orleans uh, with the Times Picayune, a photojournalist there who had uh, a difficult emotional time struggling after Katrina. Which <laughs> to be a photographer for my home newspaper. I've been a, a professional photographer since 1983. Some nasty swill in there. John McCusker's work helped the New Orleans Times-Picayune earn two Pulitzer Prizes in 2006. Yeah, sure enough, it's got fish in it. His pictures helped tell the story of Katrina. They just didn't tell his story. It's probably good, they're probably eating the mosquitoes. I'm really glad that I was a news photographer because it gave, it gave me a response to what was happening. If I'd been an electrician or an attorney or something, I might have a lot to do now, but I wouldn't have had anything to do then. I'd just been sitting on, sitting uh, somewhere in a hotel in some other state watching on CNN like everybody else. So it gave me a response. It gave me something to do. You know, I, I kept up. I was able to work for about a week, and after about a week, the trauma got to me. I couldn't read anymore. Uh, I had no concentration. Um, I was a mess. Yeah. I, I guess post-Katrina uh, population, even today, is only at, what, 75% yeah, yeah. of pre-Katrina in New Orleans. Exactly. And, and, and you really kind of felt bad saying, you know, my life's pretty terrible, Charlie. Because <laughs> Charlie would say, you know what, my life's just as bad. You know, so you, you really didn't have anybody to talk to. And so a lot of this stuff really kind of built up. And with the journalists, you know, it was 24-7. They couldn't get away from the story. They were living the story and covering it all the time. Right. And, and when you say living the story, these are people that lost their homes. Exactly. But they had to keep the job of bringing, you know, the news of Katrina and the aftermath of Katrina, the great loss uh, that took place uh, of Katrina. They were living it and reporting it. Well, think about, you know, uh, and I know you still have family down in Louisiana. Think about dealing with your family and, and not just your emotional grief, but having to deal with them and, and what they're going through. But then think about every day you go out and you're absorbing all of that from all the people you interview. And every story is a bad story. I mean, you don't get a break where you go out and tell a story about the snow cone place or anything. It's mm -hmm. just bad 24-7. And it does get to you over time. Right. And it's your community. 
it's just this paralysis from these people that are still like kind of caught up in the trauma and they just can't make a decision about what they want to do. I mean, look at this. Same as it was when day of water went down. This is John's neighborhood. He's going to rebuild, but life here after Katrina is just so frustrating. Add to that the haunting images he carries with him from the aftermath of the storm, and you can understand just how tough things are. He's lost everything, his house, his awards, and even for a time, he lost his mind. So for them, uh, they were aching, not just from what they were going through, but the, the suffering of their city, and many of them would on their weekends go out and gut homes and they called themselves the muckrakers and it really started with that newspaper, uh, the Times-Picayune, and so that's who we partnered with and that's how we, we would team up with them and we'd go out and uh, the volunteerism aspect was really, I think, so beneficial. All the screens can go in here? Okay. Natalie Pompilio saw the need for Target New Orleans. She covered Hurricane Katrina for the Philadelphia Inquirer. She was so affected by what she saw that she left Philadelphia and the paper to move here to volunteer. We're not going to change the world, but we can have one person at a time, and we can actually physically clean up the city. It was very well received. Penny Cockrell understood the need for Target New Orleans. She covered the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. At the end of the day, I could go home. I could go home. I could sleep in my own bed, and I don't think that in New Orleans, a lot of those journalists got to do that. And I think that makes a big difference. They're out there afloat, just like their community. Penny was right. Journalists at the Times-Picayune suffered just like their readers. Nearly half of the journalists on the staff lost their homes. They kept working, though. Long hours, terrible conditions. They did it in a makeshift newsroom with no place to sleep. On the weekends, they were exhausted, but they didn't stop. They started out gutting co-workers' homes. They call themselves the muckrakers. They may have started with colleagues, but soon it was anyone in the community. These journalists weren't content to write about the next chapter in the history of New Orleans. They wanted to help create it. It's not the same as getting a hug from somebody when you've helped them or helped someone that they love. You know, it's not the same as the tears you see when people are like, thank you so much for what you've done. There's no greater paycheck than right. that. Right, so you spent some time, um, you know, creating the film down there, but also volunteering Absolutely. and working in homes yeah. and in communities. Yeah. Yeah. How long yeah. were you down there in total? Well, when I went down to actually volunteer, we would go in three, four day cycles. So this is kind of the genesis of the film. I went down there and volunteered, and we had this house that we rented, and you know, at the end of the day, you were just dead tired, and you'd go back there, and there was this journal sitting there, plopped down on this table, and they everybody was told, you know, if you get a chance, write in the journal. So one night, I f wanted to be earnest, so I started writing about all my experiences and stuff, and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a look at what the other people wrote. Journalists talk about facts and figures. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about our feelings. And to read this stuff, and it was very emotional, I said to the DART administrator, I was like, you know, there's, I think there's a documentary here. You know, just people reading from the, from the journal, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. At dinner last night, I went to the restroom. Someone had written on the stall, where was Jesus during Katrina? I got to tell you, I said out loud, that's a damn good question. I followed Natalie and Gary as they walked through the lower ninth. It's like an episode of the Twilight Zone. Nothing appears to change. Everything seems frozen in time. All I could think about was how hard it would be to be the pioneer. I could see battling the forces to get your house built. That I could see myself doing. But moving into an empty neighborhood, a ghost town of abandoned houses, with no one around, no grocery stores, no schools, no signs of life, and endless sights of death all around you? They walk by a Bible on the ground in a place where it's so easy to lose faith, to lose hope, to lose your way. John McCusker and the others here probably tell you they've lost all three from time to time. It's so mishmash, a house here, a house there, and then another two blocks down. It must be painful to rebuild your home and put it all back together, but then to walk out on your front porch and look at what looks like a war zone. John showed me where he will rebuild. He says cheerfully, he'll either move into a new home or be carted off to jail. It's either one or the other. It's either a happy ending or a tragic one. 
John's like New Orleans itself. I hope John gets that happy ending. I wish it for New Orleans as well. It seems to me they deserve it. So your film is called, again, Breaking News, Breaking Down, dealing um, with various tragedies and uh, how journalists take care of it, in part about post-Katrina activities. Mike, we're really uh, happy that you came to see us today. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks very much. Charlie Abel with Travel Television. Thank you. Do you need a break? MeetPlanGo.com is ahead of the pack, leading the career break movement in the U.S. and North America, encouraging and teaching people how to take a hiatus from their job, travel the world, and have it be beneficial to their career. Meet Plan Go envisions a world where the term career break is a part of your overall career strategy, as well as an incredible resume builder. On this unique site, you can meet people like you who are supportive. Online, you will get the tools to plan interesting and civic-minded career break travels and find the inspiration to go on these alternative breaks by reading and by hearing about other career breakers, adventures, and stories. For some professions, career breaks or sabbaticals are typical and accepted, but generally they are an unheard of novel idea. This is why the founders of Meet Plan Go feel it's so important for people who are considering participation to have easy access to support and resources. After you look through the site, and if you are contemplating a break, they believe the next big step is planning. These pros understand how isolated planning a career break trip can be when you are not free to discuss it with friends, family, or employers. Having a support structure is key to making your dream a reality. Meet Plan Go is a supportive community to keep you motivated and to help you through the bumps in preparation. Read stories of other career breakers and find out everything you need to know for the sabbatical of a lifetime at this interesting and acclaimed site. Hi, this is Kevin Mayberry from Travel Television. I have with me here Marcella Camargo, the treasurer of the board of directors of MANA Project International. Nice yeah. you to be here. Thank you. Thanks. So tell us a little bit about the organization. What does it do? What is it focused on? Sure. So MANA Project International is a U.S.-based nonprofit, and we focus on holistic community development in Latin America. And we have three international sites, one in Nicaragua, one in Ecuador, and one in Guatemala. And we also have nine campus chapters. Now, when you say holistic, what do you mean by uh, holistic? Well, we understand the challenges facing these communities we work in are multifaceted and diverse. And so we try to take a multivaried approach to community development. So that means that we don't have just one area we focus in, just like health, you know, like some organizations mm -hmm. we focus on a multitude of areas. And we also let our volunteers who are there for a year, they're called our program directors, they have a lot of say of what type of programs they want to implement. Mm -hmm. You said there's health, and is there also, um, say, education as well? The main buckets that our programs fall into are health, education, and recreation, which includes things like sports programs and even uh, like yoga classes. So, and then in terms of health and education, what, mm -hmm. what, what do you focus on in those areas? So we have a lot of after-school programs for children, and we try to supplement what they learn in school. So we have things like literacy class and math class. We also teach a lot of English classes. We find that communities are really interested in learning English just because it really helps their prospects for getting jobs. Right. So we have everything from beginning English class to advanced English class. We have two types of volunteers. We have our short-term volunteers who are made up of college students. Those individuals come for either one week for spring break or they come to one of our summer programs, which is either four weeks or eight weeks. And then we also have our long-term volunteers. Those are our program directors, and they're in the country for 13 months, and they run our international site. What kind of qualifications do the program directors need? Well, above all, we want people to be passionate about international development and the organization in general. Mm -hmm. And then we also want them to be interested in developing their leadership skills. And people also need to be resourceful because you're not given, you know, day-to-day -day guidance. A lot of it is just learning on your own and then working with the community to bring about you know, the programs that they want. What kind of conditions were the places where, that you went to and things like that? I mean, all of the communities are impoverished. Mm -hmm. 
some more than others. One of the communities that I worked with is called La Chereca. And even by Nicaraguan standards, it's one of the poorest places you could possibly imagine. Mm. It's the city dump, actually. So it's where all the trash in the city gets taken to. And there are 3,000 people who live inside the dump. How do you get volunteers, actually? One of the ways is through our campus chapters. We have nine active campus chapters right now. And so one of the things they do is to advertise for us within their schools. So a lot of our volunteers come directly from that. Um, then we also have a U.S. director who's in charge of advertising widely in the U.S. So you basically also post on different websites as well? Definitely. Do you guys have a website? We do. It's www.manaproject.org. M-A-N-N-A project.org? Exactly. Okay. Well, Marcella, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. So, thank you for the opportunity. Sure. This is Kevin Mayberry, Travel Television. A part of the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps activities was the release of A Call to Peace, Perspectives of Volunteers on the Peace Corps at 50, the first report of the volunteer experience. This new report is based on the largest ever independent survey of returned Peace Corps volunteers. Significant findings reflected that the Peace Corps service was transformational. A short video was produced by the Case Foundation on the survey results, and we present it for our audience. Your willingness to contribute part of your life to this country, I think, will depend the answer whether a free society can compete. I think it can. And I think Americans are willing to contribute. But the effort must be far greater than we've ever made in the past. And that night when they heard Kennedy uh, sketch what was a, a challenge to serve overseas, a first volunteer from Milan uh, to go overseas, sent forth by Kennedy, was asked, why did you uh, join you, the silent generation? This volunteer's answer was, nobody had ever asked me to do anything unselfish, patriotic, or for the common good before. Kennedy asked. 50 years ago, uh, the Peace Corps was created, which now, over the course of the last 50 years, has sent more than 200,000 of America's best and brightest to 139 countries around the world. And we discovered in this anniversary year that there had never been a nationally representative, large-scale, independent survey of what their experiences were like, why they joined the Peace Corps. To be able to, to gauge, especially with the survey that's been done recently, how the return volunteer thinks and feels, what worked, what didn't work, is so important. Uh, the Peace Corps experience had a dramatic effect um, on return Peace Corps volunteers for the rest of their lives. I knew that when I joined the Peace Corps, I wanted to make a difference in the world, and I wanted to, to quote unquote change the world. And I knew I couldn't do that without understanding the perspectives of others. It enriches you so much. The positive, the negative, the wary, the frustrating, the sad, all of it. And it makes you so much better as a person. 98% of returned Peace Corps volunteers would recommend uh, to their child, their grandchild, and close family members that they too have the Peace Corps experience. I, I've never seen uh, such a high rate of interest in recommending any kind of effort, uh, particularly this kind of service. This survey shows the vitality and creativity of 200,000 Americans. If the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service represents the mind of U.S. foreign policy on a grassroots level, Peace Corps will symbolize the heart of U.S. foreign policy on a grassroots level. I think that American diplomacy is about relationship building, and certainly the Peace Corps volunteers on the ground, myself included, were doing just that in the local languages of our countries. The most exceptional thing that we did was to have conversations, just sharing a glass of tea and a few cookies with the women and the men and the children in our village about you know, how, how different we all were. And the Service World Agenda actually um, envisions not only expanding the Peace Corps, but growing Volunteers for Prosperity, which is a program that deploys highly skilled American professionals to work on issues like HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and a new Global Service Fellows Program, which provides opportunities for Americans to serve for up to one year. And together, these three programs uh, would meet President Kennedy's goal 
of engaging 100,000 Americans uh, serving in countries around the world every single year. Read the survey to find out how service and how living overseas with the spirit of friendship and the spirit of development can impact not only that country but your own neighborhood, your own community group as well. I think uh, John Kennedy and Sergeant Shriver who helped him build the Peace Corps Looking at it today, listening to the voices of the volunteers would say, that's great. Now, make it bigger, better, bolder. It takes so little, um, one person doing one thing, um, one person on a team of 10 gutting a house, one person uh, serving food to a resident. It's so simple. Um, there's so much to be done and it really, I mean, I think people get overwhelmed and they think like, what can I possibly do? Come down here, you can do the smallest thing and it makes such a big difference.